The following interview was conducted with Charles Bach for the Purdue University Libraries. It took place on May 4th, 2015 in Lake Tahoe. The interviewer is Tracy Grimm, Flight Archivist at the Purdue University Archives and Special Collections, and also here with us is Rita Baines from the School of Aeronautics. And you want to correct me, Rita, or your title? Director of Development. Director of Development. Thank you, Mr. Bach, for participating in our oral history interview. Um, we really appreciate you being willing to, sh willing to share your stories with us. Um, I'm going to, I have some questions that I'll ask you about your childhood, about education, and about your career. And then the last question I always ask is, is there a question that I didn't ask that you wished I had asked? So just to prepare you for that last question. So my first question is, um, where were you born and what was it like growing up? Well, I was born in Council Bluffs, Iowa, which is in the southwestern corner of Iowa. A uh, little town had, a uh, little city had a population of about 42,000 people. We had two high schools, several grade schools, but the two high schools, I guess, were most important because there was a, a lot of activity and uh, competition between the football teams and the basketball teams. And I was never very athletic, so I didn't participate, I just watched. But at any rate, uh, World War II was going on when I was uh, in high school, and uh, somehow in my growing up, I developed this great fascination about flying. I don't know exactly when that started, but I think it was when I was very young. And I just knew that I was going to get into aviation mm -hmm. some way. So I enlisted in the Army Air Corps. I was only 17, but I was out of high school. I graduated when I was 17. <clears throat> And I enlisted so I could go to uh, the Army pilot school and fly P-38s. That was my big ambition. Well, when I did achieve 18, I was left home about 10 days later, went into the Army Air Corps. And in the process of the signing uh, young people, involved in the uh, programs, I got assigned to navigation school instead of pilot training. Mm. And uh, I felt really kind of bad about this, but uh, I thought I'd just go ahead and I'd do the best I could. And I did, I became a navigator, a trained navigator, second lieutenant, and I was uh, training on a B-29 crew, uh, which, and we were gonna go to the Pacific. Uh, we hadn't quite finished training when the uh, atomic bombs were set off in Japan, and everything just came to a sudden halt. And so we weren't going any place and uh, the opportunities to leave the service were there. In fact, most of the regular people would wanted us, we who were reservists, to just go home, get out of the way. Mm. We'll have to edit this later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fine. <laughs> so anyway, I knew about the GI Bill and uh, my ability to pick the college I wanted. I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer, and uh, I uh, finally determined that Purdue was probably one of the best places I could go. And so I applied and got accepted, and along with quite a few other uh, young men just like me, freshly out of 
two years of service and uh, taken advantage of the GI Bill. I went to Purdue and they had in the field house at Purdue they'd put up double deck bunks and each bunk had a foot locker and I don't know how many hundred of us were on that field house floor in double deck bunks for a while but there were a lot of us. Wow for how long? Was it like a semester oh. or a year or just no, until you could find places for everybody to? If I could remember when <clears throat> They had finished uh, putting together dormitories that were called Seneca, and mm -hmm. they were to the west, I believe west, of Cary Hall, mm -hmm. out on the flats. They were one-story buildings with central plumbing facilities, but each person in there had his own little room. Mm -hmm. And I lived in Seneca there after the field house <laughs> for the first semester that I was there. And that I, I started in March of 46. And that summer, I went home to Council Bluffs and got married to oh. my longtime sweetheart. Oh. <laughs> and when we came back to Purdue that fall, I'd become very friendly with a fellow when we were together in the field house and we decided that we would try to find a small house to buy. So we were successful. We bought a small house way out on the edge of Lafayette, Indiana and uh, lived there until we finally graduated in the summer of 49. So that's pretty much my growing up days and my initial education. At Purdue, was there a, a, a favorite um, professor or someone who you can recall maybe influenced you? Or? <clears throat> I wish I could say that, but I can't. Or a course? A course. What do you remember most about the, um, you know, the school and the coursework? Well, I remember I I had kind of a break uh, because uh, in high school I had taken physics and all the math courses that were offered that weren't very deep, but at least I had some training that way. And having been in the military for two years, I did not have to take things young college students have to take like ROTC or physical ed or things like that. So that helped me get through the courses that were, were required and have me graduate in the summer of 49. I remember <coughs> we <coughs> I remember math got a little bit difficult for me <laughs> at the college level. It was never difficult in high school, but when we got into calculus and things like that, I really had a tough time understanding that. And while we're talking about calculus, I'll tell you when I finally realized what calculus was. Now I graduated in 49. Later on in the Air Force, when I'm in the test pilot school in 1954, one of the questions on an exam we were given is what is calculus? And what can you do with it that you can't do some other way? And I put that question off till the end because I didn't know what I was going to say. Finally, it dawned on me. So my answer was, and I got, at least my instructor said this was right. <clears throat> my answer was, calculus is a mathematical shorthand. And there isn't anything 
you can do with it that can't be done another way. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> well, what did I like about courses? Well, I enjoyed anything that had to do with aviation yeah. and aerodynamics, some air, aircraft design. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, I was very happy with my time there. I worked pretty hard. The GI Bill would not quite support a young family. My son was born, I think, 10 days before I became a senior. Wow. <laughs> And so I worked a lot of part-time jobs. Oh, goodness. Uh, as I went through the school there, which which was good. I enjoyed most of it, but it was like a big job to me. I wanted that degree because yeah. I knew that degree was going to be very important, and it certainly turned out to be yeah. very important in my lifespan. Yeah. Did you have a, sort of a vision or a dream? of what you wanted to do or the direction you wanted to go in within aviation or pilot <coughs> at that time, or did that kind of evolve? Well, at that time, my career ahead of me was quite hazy. I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to use that degree to do, but I still wanted to fly some way. I wanted to be able to fly, but I could not see a way <clears throat> clearly to do that. It cost a lot of time and it cost a lot of money to go get flying lessons on the, on the side, and I was too busy with the Purdue to do that. And I thought, someday I'll, I'll work that out. So I took a job with Boeing when I graduated in Seattle. <clears throat> and I worked, uh, actually, let me back up. I'm going to have to re-edit this whole thing. In my last semester at Purdue, I had a class on campus. I don't remember what the class was. But my next class was out at the airport. And I didn't have a car. And there was no bus that ran out there I knew of or trolley or anything. How am I going to get to the airport? It's got to be at least a mile away. So I went out to the street that ran to the airport, stuck my thumb out. And a gentleman stopped in a nice car, picked me up, and I recognized him. He was in my class on the campus. <clears throat> and so from that day on, I had a ride Perfect. out to the airport after that class, every time we had it. <clears throat> I have to branch off here a little. This is a good story. One day we didn't have a class. So Bud, I'll call him Bud and identify him later, said, well, let's go over to my house and we'll have a cup of coffee. So we get in the car and we, I said, do you have a house? <laughs> they said, oh, yes. So we go over to his house and we have a cup of coffee. And uh, he said to me as we were drinking the coffee, would you like to see pictures of some future Air Force, Army Air Corps airplanes that they're thinking about? And I said, sure, I'd love to do that. I'd love to see that. So he pulls out this notebook with pictures of airplanes that are being designed uh, for the future, and uh, he's flipping pages, and I see he stops for a second, and I see a letter addressed to Lieutenant Colonel Walker Mahuron. And I said, Bud, are you still in the Air Force? And he said, yes, I'm, I'm on active duty, but I'm assigned to college here to finish up a degree. And so we became pretty close friends in <clears throat> this semester, through the semester, and uh, I let him know that I envied the heck out of him because he'd already flown. He was an ace in uh, Europe. He flew P-47s over in Europe <clears throat> and came out of it a lieutenant colonel assigned to Purdue to finish his degree. 
and I told him that I joined the Army Air Corps to be a pilot, and they made me a navigator during War II, which I just, I did it because I had to do it. And he said, if you want to be a pilot, and you have a degree from Purdue University, and you're healthy, you apply for pilot training, they will snap you up. And I thought, my gosh, mm -hmm. here's my way of doing what I really want to do. So I did. I applied for pilot training. It took some time. So meanwhile, I took a job with Boeing and out, out in Seattle to await all the paperwork going through the proper channels and everything. And that took took quite a while. I think it. I was with Boeing there for eight or nine months waiting for assignment to pilot training, come back on active duty. I'd kept my reserve second lieutenant commission that I got when I was in the Air Force, Air Corps, before the war was over. I kept that reserve commission, so I went back on active duty as a second lieutenant to go to flying training. I was never so happy. <laughs> I just really enjoyed that year of pilot training. And where was the training? Was that in? I started out at uh, James Conway Air Force Base in Texas, and uh, that was basic. And then for advanced, they just had two schools, basic and advanced. And for advanced, day, I went to uh, Enid, Oklahoma, Vance Air Force Base. So in about a year, I came out as a second lieutenant Air Force pilot, which uh, was just like the best thing that ever happened to me. That's exactly what you wanted. Yeah, it's exactly what I wanted. My family by now, I had a young son, and uh, so they, uh, I think happily moved along whenever I got transferred to do this or that or the other thing. And did they go with you to training as well? Yes. Oh, yeah. In fact, I uh, I got married. In I got out of sequence here. After my first semester in Purdue, that summer, went home, and married my longtime love. And we came back that fall uh, together for me to pursue uh, the degree activities. And let's see, I think about 10 days before I became a senior, our son was born. So <laughs> you had your we, hands had a, full. we had our hands full <laughs> that last year at Purdue. But we made it, we made it through. Took a job with Boeing, waiting to uh, get called back into pilot training because I had applied for that already. And after eight or nine months with Boeing, I got recalled to go to pilot training. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1950. Mm -hmm. I have here, you got your wings in 1951? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then went off to Korea. <clears throat> 1952? <clears throat> yeah, let's see now. How was I? <laughs> Suddenly the... <laughs> let's quit here for a second. Sure, yeah. Let You're asking about Korea. Yes, I, uh, I graduated from pilot training in 1951. And I was stationed at James Connolly Air Force Base in Texas. And uh, I went to Korea in July of 52. And I was there until uh, March of 53. And I was uh, in the third bomb wing. And we flew, <coughs> we flew the B-26 twin engine, uh, light bomber, <coughs> all of our, with two exceptions, 
all of my 50 missions were at night. It was night armed recce up over North Korea. And you would be assigned a route to fly up in North Korea and a certain time to stay on it. And you could attack anything you saw moving. So <clears throat> that was the my uh, flying experience in Korea. Fifty-one, fifty-one combat missions. I, that's, yeah, I got an e I got an extra. The tour was supposed to be fifty missions, but I got an extra because some general came along and wanted a ride over North Korea, so he picked me to take it. <laughs> well, fifty-one then. <laughs> so I got my fifty-first mission over North Korea. Huh. It must have been. Dangerous. I mean, it's sort of the beginning of <clears throat> well risk and I didn't have any bad experiences over North Korea at night. The two daylight missions my wing flew up there were scary. There was a lot of flak and almost every airplane got hit, but none were shot down. We felt fairly comfortable at night, although there were North Korean ground units with uh, pretty heavy weapons that would hear you go over and take a few shots at you. But uh, they got close to me one night, but I never got hit. So then after Korea, um you went to the uh, Air Force Experimental Test Pilot School <clears throat> at Edwards, is that right? It was at Edwards Air Force Base, yes. And I, when did I start there? 1954? 54. I <coughs> yes, I applied for this school because I had the degree in aeronautical engineering. I thought this is a natural progression and should be very interesting to get into flight test. So I got accepted and I started in January of 54 and graduated that summer. I was temporarily assigned to El Centro, California, which is a joint Air Force Navy station, but very soon was brought back to Edwards and assigned in the bomber branch. Uh, at Edwards, which was the flight test center for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now you you um, donated to the archives some some photographs of of you uh, with the the Bell X two. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the X <clears throat> program and your role? Well. <clears throat> The uh, X model airplanes were all flown by uh, young pilots who had almost all fighter aircraft time, used to small, fast airplanes. I just happened to come out of flying training uh, with multi-engine, uh, and I was assigned in flight test ops to the bomber branch of flight test ops. Well, we flew the carrier airplanes for the X model airplanes. They might be uh, in the bomb bay. The early ones, the X-1s, were fitted in the bomb bay of a B-29. That was slightly before my time. My time, the X-2 was starting to fly, and we had it uh, attached to a B-50, which was a little bigger bomber, uh, would carry a little more weight, a little faster. So I did get to fly uh, launch missions where I was a carrier pilot and I'd launch the, the X-2, later the X-15, at the appropriate place and altitude. Interesting programs. Yeah, um, 
So that was an interesting time. I mean, that was the the mid '50s, um, and the space race '56. We're we're starting to. What was that like? What was the? I mean, do you remember the? I mean, was there a lot of? Was it a fast pace? Was it pressure? What, did you, well, I don't remember a great deal of pressure, but I remember that we always had programs we were working on. Those are pilots like me in flight test operations, whether you were in the bomber branch, the fighter branch, or the cargo miscellaneous branch. There were a lot of active programs in those days. And it was a busy place and a great place for somebody that loved to fly. It was a great place to be. And you had some fellow Purdue graduates who were there with you who <clears throat> loved to fly. Can you talk a little bit about those I'd like guys? to talk about that. It was, I don't know exactly how I discovered this, but I did discover this. There were four of us at the same time in flight test stops. There was Ivan Kinchlow, he was in the fighter branch. There was myself, I was in the bomber branch. There was Henry Gordon, he was in the fighter branch. Reese Martin was in the cargo miscellaneous branch. And up the lake bed a little ways was a NASA facility and Neil Armstrong was there. And that made five of us Purdue graduates all there at the same time. I think that I graduated from Purdue in 49. I think a couple of those may have graduated in 1950. I'm not sure. But it was very unique and I thought about trying to get all of us together for a nice photo op or nice little story or something, but we were all so busy and frequently assigned TDY someplace, maybe to the manufacturer of some airplane that we were gonna test, that it was very difficult. I never got everybody together. What does TDY mean? Temporary duty. Temporary duty. Yeah. Uh, in this kind of business, like for instance, uh, maybe a new Boeing airplane was coming along, like the KC-135, the tanker, or even the B-52. If you were going to be assigned into one of those programs, you would go temporary duty to the manufacturer, to Boeing in Seattle, and go to school on that airplane. Their pilots had probably already flown it, but it was still brand new and not fully tested yet. Mm -hmm. So we'd be sent off to ground school, usually, and then it wouldn't be long before we'd have one of those airplanes at Edwards and have a very active program going on it. That was very typical what was going on in those days. Can you talk a little bit about what your 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 duties were as a as a test pilot <clears throat> what were you looking for what were you, was it calculus <laughs> <laughs> no no flight test is is a big business all by itself uh, for the actual what we call flight test there are two major categories one is performance How, how fast, how high, how quickly does it climb, its performance, how much fuel does it use. The other major category is stability and control. Can you control this thing? Does it fly well? You know? Uh, so there are a lot of tests developed to prove performance and other tests that prove handling qualities or stability and control. And then one that goes right along with the whole thing is uh, accelerated service. What parts wear out first, you know? That sounds a little scary. <laughs> uh, that's all a part of, of a new airplane, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. goes along with the other two major categories is uh, 
a lot of things fail on, <laughs> on new airplanes quite often, and that, that's part of the testing program to find out what those things are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like it might have taken, did it take a little bit of, of you know, your engineering background, the technical part, but also more of a sort of the soul of, of you know, how <clears throat> an airplane <clears throat> functions, feels, responds? Well, the engineering background was very valuable to me. To, you have to understand the flight test engineers that put together <laughs> a flight and it, what exactly what tests you're going to do. And so you have to work very closely with them. The engineering background was very helpful. Mm-hmm. But you also become pretty experienced in flying different airplanes because you fly a lot of different airplanes. They do that on purpose. The fighter branch or the bomber branch or the cargo miscellaneous branch, which included helicopters, by the way, all have support airplanes there. They may be a little bit older airplanes, but they're kept there to keep the pilots up to speed in flying. You don't just wait for a new test airplane to come along and fly it. You've got to keep your your uh, feelings about flying, your ability to fly, and it's uh, that's why they have the support airplanes around mm-hmm. to keep you active flying, mm-hmm. and uh, that's very helpful, of course. But it's always uh, exciting to be assigned to a new airplane, a new test program. Mm-hmm. And I got assigned to quite a few of those. Did you ever um, work on the, on the dinosaur project? <clears throat> no, but I was selected for, I was one of seven selected for a special school. We, I called it the uh, Graduate Test Pilot School, <laughs> but it was known as the Aerospace... Oh, I wrote it down. Oh, my. Aerospace Research Pilot School. Now, that was formed because the Air Force in those days, which would have been... 62? Was that 62? Yeah. Oh, God, why why don't I have that right there? I can't think of the exact dates now. But anyway, I, I applied for the school because I knew they would want people in there. And the school was aimed at space because of those two space programs that the Air Force had. One was a manned orbiting laboratory and the other was dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And so the school was formed to help train people for that. Well, they'd already had pilots and others associated with those projects. uh, Probably uh, sitting in on uh, sessions with the companies that were building these things and, and so forth. But there were several pilots, most of them out of flight test ops earlier, that were associated with those programs. But here we come with a new bunch of seven in, into this school. So I got selected for it. I was very lucky. Very lucky, and uh, so we were just training away and and uh, doing things, uh, learning more about orbits and orbital mechanics and zoom climbs and things. We had some fascinating little flight test programs to do while we're in this school. Uh, 
before we graduated from the school, both those space programs were canceled. And whatever was left over from them was given to NASA. So, <laughs> should I continue with my story? Yeah, that must have been disappointing to say the least. <clears throat> yes, it was disappointing. <laughs> now, what are they going to do with me when I finish this six-month program? Or what are they going to do with all seven of us? Well, they went off to various assignments. But, of course, we were at Edwards Air Force Base for this whole thing, for this school. And just about the time we're graduating, the bomber branch of flight test operations is given a follow-on test program on a B-58, which was a Delta Wing four-engine jet bomber, which I had been involved in the flight test of in those earlier days at Edwards. So here comes this program, and it's, it's a program mostly to measure performance of the airplane carrying a bunch of external weapons that it hadn't carried before. They didn't have anybody in flight test ops that had ever flown a B-58. <laughs> so there I am. There you are. And B-58 experience, yes. Let's put him back in flight test ops. So I did another five years in my <laughs> type of flying that I loved and really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I got back into it because of this particular B-58 program. Mm -hmm. Well, that led to other really good things. Mm -hmm. Such as? Well, you know, while I... This uh, B-58 program ran several months, I, I know that. And somewhere along the line in there, President Johnson had announced the existence of a special reconnaissance high-speed airplane, which uh, he named the SR-71. I brought some photographs of you. Is this? Are that's, you? that's the suit you wear. See, and, it, and it's always striking, especially <clears throat> when uh, we have some kids who come to the archives and we show them some of the test pilot um, gear for some of these programs. And, oh, those are astronauts. Can you talk a little bit about the suit? I mean... Well, the suit is very, pressure. very, yeah. very similar to astronaut yeah. suits. Yes, they're full pressure suits designed to keep you alive at extreme altitudes. And uh, that's what we wore in the... Uh, Blackbird, I'll call it, test program. Because <clears throat> after my B-58 experience and being able to get back into flight test ops, which I loved, uh, all of a sudden this airplane comes along. Uh, the president announced the existence of it, called it the SR-71, I believe. And it was a super hush-hush deal. And uh, I'm not sure the exact sequence or what people would be interested in, but there were two pilots out of flight test operations that would disappear every now and then. We didn't know where they went, and they wouldn't <laughs> say where they went. But where they actually went, we found out later, was up to Area 51, the place you couldn't mention or even dream about, you know, and they were flying the original versions of the SR-71 up there. And so the program's announced, and one Saturday, two of them flew from Area 51 into Edwards Air Force Base. And my... Uh, real close friend who was a flight test engineer just happened to be out on the base that Saturday morning, looked up and couldn't believe what he was seeing because he'd never seen anything like that before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
and the word was out in a split second <laughs> about these airplanes. And actually, they weren't SR-71s, they were YF-12s. It was an earlier version of the airplane that had been built to explore the idea of a Mach 3 interceptor intercepting incoming enemy airplanes. They built three of those. And two of them came into the base that morning. <laughs> Excitement <laughs> reigned supreme. I can imagine. They couldn't put them in a hangar. They had them on the north end of the base, out on the ramp there. They couldn't, they weren't equipped quite to put them in hangars yet, so they were sitting out in the open. It didn't take long for the traffic jam to develop. <laughs> And they, they had to get the air police out on the road, which from the road you could see these airplanes. Wow. Sitting there. Nobody would seen anything like this. So they got the air police out there to keep the traffic moving, <laughs> make people keep going. And uh, I thought, oh boy, what a neat airplane. And then one day, a, few, a week or two later, one of the guys who'd been disappearing, you know, and coming back, took a local fly in one. And I'm in test ops, standing there watching him taxi by in this <laughs> airplane. I was thinking, boy, I'd sure love to fly that, and darn if I didn't get selected. Oh, that's great. I got selected to that program. And How that, different was it for you to fly? I mean, how different of a machine was it? Was it? Well, it was quite different. Uh, it's so much faster. And, you know, it just, it flew very much like any other airplane, but things were happening pretty fast. <laughs> and it was a very exciting way to fly. I don't know how else to explain it. Initially, in the, I got checked out in the, in the YF-12, which is what we had there. The SR-71 hadn't come into the program yet at Edwards. So my initial flights in it were just, were not in the pressure suit. We didn't intend to go too high on those flights. These were orientation flights. Can you get it up and get it down, you know? <laughs> well, of course you can. <laughs> It's just when it starts going real fast. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just learning its characteristics. It was mm -hmm. different. Uh, when you let the uh, augmenters on the engine, the thing really took off. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could, a lot of earlier airplanes that had afterburners, when you kick the throttle forward into afterburner, you get a big bang in the afterburner light and away you'd go. And you never, you just left it there until you wanted to slow down. In the SR, you could augment, you could modulate the power. You could go into burner and then just keep going further and further and further into burner so you didn't have to go max all the time. You could throttle back a little bit and, and cruise nicely at Mach 3. So this was a different world to be up in. So very exciting, very mm -hmm. exciting. So that was, what year was that? That was in the 60s, 62. Yeah, 65 and 65. 66, I was flying the SR-71 and the YF-12. I wound up with, uh, I think, 200 hours in the SR-71 and 25 hours in the YF-12. YF-12 was prior to the SR-71. It was my trainer, so to speak. <laughs> that must have been exciting. Those were exciting days, yes. Never had, never had a serious problem with the SR-71 at all. It's really a remarkable airplane for what it would do at that time. Mm -hmm. It was mostly titanium, which the company had to figure out how to work titanium to 
shape it into an airplane, for instance, the flight regime was just something pretty darn new to fly that high, that fast. You know, the airplanes like the X-1, the X-2, they already been up and higher and faster and all that. But here we have an airplane that's going to be able to take off and land by itself and get up there and cruise at Mach 3 anywhere up to 80,000 feet or a little more. Wow. I wonder if we have another picture there. Well, there's one in the background. Yeah, it's just such a beautiful design. I mean, it was a super design. Just great to look at. Well, there's just side view on. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. There's another one of my programs there. Dropping the X-15. So then I have in my notes that you did a two-year tour in England. I did. <clears throat> I'd been to the industrial college in uh, Virginia, Fort McNair, Virginia, which is about a year program. It's one of the senior schools uh, you go to if you get that far. <laughs> it's like the Army War College. Uh, Air Force, Air War College. Then there's this Industrial College of the Armed Forces, which sort of lends itself to the manufacturing side of all, and development side of all this kind of thing. Oh. Uh, anyway, I was assigned to that. So I came out of there and had not been to Vietnam yet. And so we got our assignments when we graduated there, uh, what we were going to do in Vietnam. Uh, the initial assignment I got, I didn't really care for, so I asked for, because I had a really good friend going through the school with me that had been in F-100, single engine fighter, old but still being used, mostly for ground attack. It couldn't compete against MiGs anymore. But I asked for an assignment to F-100s because of this fellow, good friend of mine, and he was going over into 100s also. And I thought, I got a good chance of getting a squadron, you know, and to do this. So I go to training at Luke Air Force Base uh, in Arizona on the F-100, trained to uh, fly it, to shoot the guns, to drop bombs and everything else. And just before I'm ready to graduate from there and get a Vietnam assignment, I got on the promotion list to Bird Colonel. And even though I wasn't going to become a genuine Bird Colonel for another year, I, uh, that's the way they did it. I got on the list a little early, and I wasn't going to pin my rank on for another year, they couldn't put me in a lieutenant colonel's slot, which is what I was trying to get to in Vietnam as a F-100 squadron commander. So I go to England for two years instead to a 20th TAC fighter wing over there as an assistant deputy commander for operations, which was a colonel's slot. <laughs> and that's I did my two years over there before I went to Vietnam and then um, in Vietnam how, how it, I was wondering like how, did, how have things changed between Korea and Vietnam <clears throat> well I guess there were a lot of differences a lot of differences There was so much 
more, I think, from my viewpoint, I was flying F-100s in Vietnam. Our missions were all air to ground. We would, I would take, a, if I happened to be lead that day, I'd take a four ship formation out to rendezvous with a forward air controller. Forward air controller would be way down there, not too high off of the ground, but he knew where the enemy trucks were and fuel dumps and things like that. And we, we would rendezvous with him, get him a hold on the radio, you know, and he would coach us into where he wanted us to put our bombs or shoot the guns. So usually he would put a smoke rocket out and we'd verify we had, we knew where the smoke rocket was and he'd say, okay, put some bombs like 500 meters north of that smoke. He would guide us, he'd give us the target. You couldn't see anything, it was all jungle. All jungle down there. All you could see was just smoke. Try to put your bombs or your guns on wherever he told you to do it. So that's what we'd do, fly to four. Now in Korea, well, also back to Vietnam again, you know, they had these huge formations of F-105s and so forth that came out of Thailand and they are, their primary mission was putting bombs on targets up in North Vietnam. So there was a lot of air to ground bombing. B-52s coming in from bases in the Pacific with, with uh, Oh gosh, maybe a hundred, five hundred pound bombs aboard, dropping those as directed by forward air controllers. Lots of air to ground. Some air to air, where fighters were up looking for uh, Vietnamese fighter aircraft. There was also some of that going on, but it seemed to me like there was a lot more air to ground work. Back in Korea, <laughs> it seemed like most of the day opera operations in Korea were fighter airplanes like the F-86 and they'd head up north to the northern boundary of Korea looking for MiGs and a lot of air to air. And then people in units like myself with a light bomber, we would go out mostly at night and do air to ground. We had bombs, we had three inch rockets, we had 50 caliber machine guns so we could, and we were always in there low level looking for targets. Trucks, mostly trains, if you could find a train that made a good target. So the operations just seem a little bit different between those two wars. And you flew, I have 52 combat missions in Vietnam? Yeah, so I had a total of 103 wow. total combat missions in the, the two different war, wow. totaling up the two different wars. And then um, after after your service in Vietnam, oh, Air National Guard at the Pentagon, is that right? Yes, I, uh, I was assigned to the Air National Guard headquarters in the Pentagon as the Chief of Safety for the Air National Guard. Hmm. I worked for a wonderful General I.G. Brown, who never got terribly excited, uh, about things that happened. So I, 
was different than the Air Force. In the Air Force, if some base lost an airplane or two, they got very excited about it, jumped all over everything and into the into the problem. In the Air National Guard, if we lost an, an F-100, say, the pre previous night, and I come into work, and I find, well, actually, I'd get a call at home, and I'd know this happened. I'd come into work. The general wasn't on my back immediately, you know, to, to tell him exactly what happened, because I didn't know yet. And, uh, and he, that's the kind of guy he was. He just, he'd hang in there, let us find out what, what happened, and it was, Compared to the Air Force, I think it was a more relaxed atmosphere to work in. Although being chief of safety or being in the safety business wasn't exactly what I would like to do, but it was an interesting assignment. It was an interesting assignment and good in some ways, very good in some ways. <clears throat> but I was coming up on 30 years and uh, all of a sudden along comes this bit of information about I was being considered to be the chief test pilot on the B-1 program whenever Rockwell got it built. They were working on it. <clears throat> well, I was still in the Air Force, but I was coming close to 30 years and I, I knew I could get out if I wanted to, real easy, in fact, not for publication, but they were getting rid of colonels. <laughs> we had plenty of colonels in the Air Force. <laughs> and I, <clears throat> but anyway, after some talking with my boss in the Air Guard there, and talking with company people at Rockwell, used to be North American Aviation, Rockwell had purchased it and the banter going back and forth, they decided that I would be the chief test pilot on the B-1. And so I just arranged to retire right at 30 years and uh, just worked out perfect. Went to work for Rockwell, flew the B-1, all the initial flights and many more and worked for them for about eight years and retired again at the ripe old age of 55. So you were, you, you took the, the, the um, you, you did the first test flight on that plane. On the B-1? Yeah. Yes. What was that like? Well, that was pretty exciting because you don't, you don't get too many first flights. Yes. Uh, although I had a couple similar <clears throat> to first flights, but this was a genuine first flight in a brand new airplane and the engines had never even been airborne on some test airplane like it. A lot of times they would hang a new engine on the, under the wing of a, of a uh, 707 KC-135 just to fly the engine and see how it worked at different speeds and altitudes and everything. I hadn't done that with the engines on the B-1. So we went, <laughs> we went airborne with a new airplane, four brand new engines, all at the same time. Wow. And it worked out well, worked out well. Never had any serious problems with it. What was the mental preparation like I mean, did you have to go through a different process to, in that well, case, or? Well, first thing you have to do is just know the airplane really well, oh. all the systems, you know, how they work, how they might malfunction, what, what do you do if they do malfunction, you know? Like, I was flying one day out, we did all our B-1 flying out over the Pacific Ocean just off the coast going north and south, because we had room there to work. You can't test fly an airplane like a B-1 in the cramped confinements of the Edwards Air Force Base restricted area. You barely get started on a good point and you're, you gotta turn around. 
So this was my idea, and they bought it. We do our long runs out over the ocean. There were stations along the way that we transmitted data to that went immediately to the control room at Edwards. And <laughs> oh, I was getting to maybe some kind of a scare in a brand new airplane. Okay, we're out there over the ocean. All three generators tripped off the line. All I had left was a little battery power and the nose of the airplane's going down like this. <laughs> I got a, we had a panel here with about 70 caution lights on it. Little uh. caution light. They were all lit. <laughs> and I told the co-pilot, let's reset those generators. Let's get a generator up here. And so we reset, we set them one at a time, and I think we got all three back online. So now we have full power, full power again. And uh, so little things like that happen in flight <laughs> test and airplanes. Some of them are, get pretty bad, but yeah. all in all, the V-1 program, the airplane was well built, well designed, and flew really well. So where were we? I was at, when I was in the B one program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yep. I was responsible for training all the crews, making sure the helping plan the flight tests, of course, doing most of the things that required being done first. I did like air refueling. Uh, oh. What else was I thinking of? First supersonic flight, and things like that. All the first stuff, uh, first time they were done, I usually did them. My first co-pilot was an Air Force friend of mine, Colonel, who had the Air Force branch of the B-1 flight test operation. Air Force heavily involved with this. They were buying it, it was their money. But the contractor, which I was now a contractor, civilian pilot, the contractor always had to demonstrate safety of flight first before the user could get into the program. So there were a number of flights in which we Actually, we had the Air Force along right from the start because this test force was was put together as one big unit. And uh, like I said, my, my co-pilot on the first flight was an Air Force colonel who had been in flight test ops with me years before and knew him very well. We were good friends. And that, so the Air Force participated in the B-1 flight test right from the word go. And uh, I think I flew the first three flights in the pilot's seat. And then the fourth flight, I put the colonel over there and I flew in the right seat, co-pilot seat, the flight instructor seat. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I was over there, I was the IP, the instructor pilot. You, you, you're not going to put all this stuff in there, are you? It's all getting in there. It's all good. Uh, well, anyway, eight years of that. And what happened in the V-1 program in those days, we were allowed four airplanes. There were going to be four airplanes, four test airplanes, each one having a different... Uh, test regime to do and they would be instrumented differently and we were allowed a total of 1900 flying hours for this program and we were getting the, this program started when uh, Jimmy Carter canceled the production program so that you know, for some reason or other, it allowed the flight test program to go. 
So we, we got our four airplanes and we flew a total of 1,900 hours and that was the end of it. But uh, Rockwell didn't throw away all the nuts and bolts and tools and stuff because he knew when uh, Ronald Reagan got elected, the program would be back on, which it was. But there was a long, quite a long gap. I can't remember exactly how long now. But it was very slow, and I felt like I'm taking advantage of Rockwell here, just not doing anything really productive, because our flight test program was over. We were just sitting around kind of waiting, and we were flying. We had some kind of airplanes to fly for proficiency. So I just decided to... Uh, ask my boss to retire me early. Normal age retirement uh, for a Rockwell test pilot was age 58, but you could retire early at 55. You could. You don't make as much money in, in retirement, but you could retire. And I was already retired from the Air Force. So uh, rather than just hunt around for things to do, which I was doing. I didn't like that. That doesn't I, sound like you. <laughs> I told my other two guys, who, along the way, I'd gotten the company to hire two more pilots, you know, because I couldn't do everything by myself, two more company pilots. I told them, this, hell, hang on, because if a production program comes along, you're going to be sitting in really well. You'll be sitting in really well, but... I think I've got other things to do. I've got a lot at Lake Tahoe that needs a home built on it. And so that was why I just, I, two reasons. I had the, something that I really wanted to do and I didn't like looking around trying to find things to do while I was working for Rockwell and getting paid pretty good. So I left Rockwell, came to Lake Tahoe, and uh, the next couple of years got a house built. I've been here ever since. Built yourself a plane. Oh yeah, in that <laughs> period of time, I did build a little airplane of my own, yes. Yeah. Well, is there any question that I didn't ask you <laughs> that you wish we asked? I had some interesting programs while I was still in the Air Force at Edwards on my first tour. You saw a picture of uh, this big crew out in front of a oh, B-50. Yeah. B well, let's say this one too. Out in front of a B-50, we carried the X-2, this airplane. Yeah. We carried this rocket airplane up. So I was a uh, mothership. I have always hated that term. <laughs> Carrier airplane pilot on the, on the B-50 and launched the X-2 a couple of times. Once on this flight, and I'll tell you about that picture later. And then uh, I was picked to do the uh, carrier airplane, the B-52, to drop the X-15. X-15, where's that? Well, we had a picture of that. Yeah, it's around someplace. And that's the bird that took people took pilots up to very high, very fast. In fact, in the X-15, I've got a picture of it over there. The X-15, yeah. Well, those guys were, were called the, the, the yeah. first spacemen, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, when they got so high, they got an astronaut rating. Here's the B-52 with the X-15 attached. Oh, yeah. Haven't launched it yet. That's, that's something else, yeah. I haven't launched it yet. Yeah. You've seen that? But, it's right there. Now that one we had to put outside because the, the fuselage wasn't constructed 
in such a manner and a way that we could fit an X-15 inside like these other airplanes, they fit it up into the Bombay areas. The X-15 had to be out here. So that was a very interesting program. I was very happy to be assigned number one carrier driver on that one. And my first passenger out there was Scotty Crossfield, which is very well known in flight test circles. Is that him? Yes, as a matter of fact, this is Scotty, and this is our crew. This chap here, who I asked my boss and bombers to put with me on this program, I had known for, how old was I? We were little chums at about four years old, <laughs> growing up in the same neighborhood in Council Bluffs, Iowa. <laughs> Small world. <laughs> yeah. He came into flight test ops in about 1955 or somewhere in that area. I asked my boss to put him in bombers with me. So anyway, then on this program, I asked my boss to give me Jack as my co-pilot and this Scotty, we were Mr. Crossfield, Bill Berkowitz, he handled all the, see we carried liquid oxygen and other other things that needed to be serviced on the X-15 because uh, as you go to altitude these systems in there are vented so they start to lose like a little bit of liquid oxygen. You got to reservice it just before launch. And he's the guy that ran the big panel back behind the pilot seats to do that. And this was our, our uh, crew chief. Neat guy. I, why can't I say his name? Come on, come on, come on. Can't say his name. But he, he was the crew chief on the airplane. He kept it flyable. <laughs> So anyway, that was a great program. So I met all these guys that ran that program from, it was a North American aviation program. All old timers been with North American for a long time. Wonderful bunch of guys. And in this one, this day, we launched the X-2 with Pete Everest in it. He was a lieutenant colonel. He was the chief of flight test operations in the, my first tour in flight test ops. He was the chief. And of course, he uh, could pick the flights he wanted, of course. <laughs> and I think he'd flown the X-1 also, I think. I think. But anyway, we launched him this day. Fitz Fulton was my was my other B-52 pilot. I was pilot. Stu Childs was chief of fighter branch. He was flying a chase airplane out here watching. Kinchlow was flying a chase airplane out here just watching things, as was Mel Apt. Now, Mel Apt was the next pilot picked to fly the X-2. And just a few months later, he was killed in the X-2. So out of all these guys, I don't know whether Stu's still alive, Fulton's dead, I'm not sure about Everest, Kinchlow's dead and Mel's dead. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm one of their survivors so far. I noticed that uh, Mr. Crossfield and this gentleman, was there a height limit on those guys too? These were tiny cockpits in these X airplanes. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, Chuck Yeager's not much bigger than these guys either. I mean, he, yeah. he was the first supersonic guy, you right. know. Yeager was still there when I was assigned to flight test ops, so I got to know him fairly well. What'd you think of him? Or hmm? what, what was he like? Well, we were never very close. We were never very close, just... He was always friendly to me, and me to him. Uh, it must have been a small community. I mean, you, there weren't many of you out there, right? Not too many. Let's see, we had probably, let's say, off the top of my head, six pilots in each branch. Three branches, maybe, maybe 18, 15, 
test pilots and flight test ops to cover all these different airplanes, different helicopters, different airplanes that were designed to go vertical, you know, with big props fly, <laughs> trying to pull this thing up off the ground and keep it stable and all that stuff. Lots of experiments. <laughs> Lots of experimental stuff going on, yeah. It's covered pretty good by flight test ops with about maybe 15 pilots. Good old days, not like that anymore. There aren't that many airplanes coming along anymore. See, we always had airplanes coming along. Mm -hmm. My very first, no, I don't. My very first project was the, was the RB66, a reconnaissance version of the B66 twin engine jet light bomber. They had to produce a reconnaissance version of that. That was my first program, which uh, I did. Had a lot of fun with that. And I was lucky enough to be assigned to this great program, the B-58. I had this airplane with me for a year at Edwards. It was the first airplane that ever left the factory. Wow. It was very early in the flight test of the B-58. I brought it to Edwards, and I wasn't the only pilot to fly this particular airplane. My immediate boss, had preceded me in flying this airplane down at the factory. And a general had flown it, Air Force general had flown it. I was the third Air Force pilot to fly a B-58. And I took the first one away from the plant that ever left there, and took it to Edwards, had it for a year. Well, my immediate boss flew it every now and then and then we did check out a couple of other guys because you, you really needed to check out your other pilots as quickly as you could in new airplanes because that's how we got experience. That's one reason we had support airplanes in flight tests so that you could fly often and stay proficient mm -hmm. and learn about different airplanes, what's good, what's bad. You know, so. If you got assigned something really new, you could make some intelligent comment on what was good and what might be bad, what might need repair. So, a very interesting period of my life. Sounds like you ended up in the, the perfect profession for you. With for me, it love, was. Love of baby of flying and yeah. staying busy. And for me, it was, and all of that, I got. I flew probably, I think my count is 105 different airplanes. I think the count's 105. Now, actually, some of those I flew, I didn't check out in. I wasn't fully qualified as first pilot. I'll admit that. But about 75 of them, I was fully qualified in 75 different airplanes over the period of what, 19 years I spent in flight test. That's a lot. <laughs> Do you remember when we were at the, uh, at the Purdue Archives and we pulled out uh, one of Jerry Ross's uh, flight logs or yeah, books and your name was on that? Yeah. So was I, I call those flight cards. They're a small book, several flight pages. Cards. Every page has exactly what you're supposed to do in it written down there. You do it in sequence because people down below in the control room, they're watching that too. Oh. They, know, they know exactly what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. I suppose there's... I could talk about other things, but... That's not much. We've covered it pretty well. I flew a lot of airplanes. I was very happy to be assigned to some of those. Very happy. 
Thank you. Most welcome. Well, I have one regret I can think of right off the bat. I belong to a group called the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. And I'd been in it quite a long time, in fact, so long enough to be elected vice president. Uh, I can't remember the exact year now, I'm sorry about that. And of course, the natural progression is to run for president the next year. And I regret not doing that. But I did it because I did not run. I had a pretty good chance of being elected president of that society. I did not run because I was so heavily involved with the B-1 at the time. And I thought, what do I tell my boss? And I don't want to take lots of time off to do this other job. I couldn't do that. So that's why I didn't run. When I look back on it years later, I'm thinking I probably could have done that. Mm. And I regret not trying. Mm. I did see though that you got a couple of awards from them. So I don't think they held it against you, <laughs> the organization. Oh no, I yeah. was I was lucky there too. Yeah. I got yeah. a couple of very nice awards yeah. from the society, yeah. Wouldn't be far different than what you experienced. <clears throat> It'll be a lot different because they're just not producing the airplanes like they used to. Uh, uh, it's more unmanned airplanes. Uh, there are a few coming along, like the F 35. Uh, that'll keep a few pilots busy for quite a while uh, in the testing phase because. They seem to have a lot of little problems that they have to keep working over and that requires, I think people are more familiar with the testing atmosphere of airplanes. So we'll always need a few. As far as I know, the school is still producing people qualified to go into flight test as pilots or in some other job. But they're more unmanned Air vehicles coming along. Um, well, I hadn't thought about something else. What would it have been? I can't think of it at the moment. Oh, uh, space efforts. They're still, still uh, probably recruiting people for astronaut jobs. Space isn't over yet slowed down quite a bit, I guess, but it's not over. There's some opportunities for young men that want to be high flyers, I guess. a good share of the work at Edwards has been on unmanned air vehicles for quite some time. I know that having the F-35 there would have been a really good boost in the arm <laughs> for Edwards in the in actual flight test of airplanes. One more little item associated with flight tests that might be interesting. If a company's building an airplane like a B-1 or a B-52 or a KC-135 or something large enough that can carry two pilots and maybe one or two more people, the very important people will be lined up to get a flight in that new airplane. <laughs> And it's all right, it's, it's customary. And I'll give you one good example is the B-1. Now Barry Goldwater, Senator Goldwater, was always a supporter of the B-1. He was, he was for it. And so, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember the exact flight we had him. 
let's just say it was the 14th flight in the V1 program, we put Senator Goldwater in, I put him in the left seat, in the pilot seat, in the B1, right from the start. <laughs> After a big briefing we had, we had a big briefing to tell the senator exactly what we were going to do, what we had to do on this flight. This could not be just a fun flight for a VIP. It had to produce some, some works. <laughs> so we had a flight plan, things we had to do on that flight. But it was arranged and I knew it well enough. So I, and Mr. Senator Goldwater was a pilot. He'd flown a lot of airplanes. So I put him in the left seat and I just coached him uh, through all the engine start, the taxi, did very well and take off, okay, you know, power up and keep it going straight, rotate now and gear up and away we go. Climb at this particular speed, he was doing a great job. And we went ahead, climbed the altitudes we were supposed to be at, did our flight test card and everything. And uh, we flew for, uh, gosh, I could look it up. You want to cut that a minute? We did our flight, got our little tests all complete, came, came back for landing at Edwards. And uh, I coached the senator on turn base, turn final, and he was doing a great job of flying the airplane, no problem. And I uh, said, now let's hold this particular speed down final. We got the gear and flaps down and all that. And he's right on the speed. I asked him to hold and uh, uh, gets to the runway and flares. And I said to myself, I think the main gear is on the ground. <laughs> and it was. It was the most gentle touchdown ever made in a B-1. <laughs> <laughs> At least to that day, to that date. It was incredible. Just such a smooth touchdown, lets the nose down, get, <laughs> gets on the air brakes up, and drag chute out and all that stuff. Did you have a drag chute? Skip the part about the drag chute. Just air brakes. He did a great job of flying. Well, there were others that came along. Senator Jake Garn from Utah got a flight. General Doherty, commander of SAC, got a flight. Naturally, he would. He was going to have the airplane in SAC. And oh my gosh. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, the first time he was Secretary of Defense, I took him up. <laughs> and uh, that's all I can think of at the moment. But it's interesting that this happens on, on new airplanes. People that, politically powerful people who have supported a program, they're going to want a flight and they get a flight. <laughs> That's the way it works. Yeah, that's the way it works. <laughs> well, that's a good story.